So, Monica Richardson, filmmaker behind the 13th step. Yes. Congratulations, welcome to Berlin. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. No, honestly, I've seen this, I've seen your films a couple of times, I really loved it. Um, could you, you know, I'm going to ask you the synopsis, of course. Right. What, what, first of all, what, what it's about and why you decided to make the film? What the film is about is mainly that the courts are ordering violent offenders to Alcoholics Anonymous and the public doesn't know and members don't know and women have started to get murdered. Right. But it's also about sexual harassment and predation that's systemic in Alcoholics Anonymous which is why it was called the 13th step. Yeah. Because so, the AA program is 12 steps isn't it? Right, it's yeah. 12 steps. And this is a euphemism, like it's only insiders know that the 13th step is, uh, a, that it's about sexual harassment if you're an insider you know what the thing yeah, is yeah yeah of course it, and sorry and how did you get because it's a powerful subject I mean, obviously, but how did you get drawn in drawn to make this film where did it all sort of begin from uh where it began was that i was once a member yeah and i was i would say 13 stepped twice when i was 18 and 19 right and then i kind of just survived, you know, went on, and then years later, uh, a young woman came to our meeting, and she was badly 13-stepped, and I started to go back out to mixed meetings in LA, and we discovered that it was really bad in the way that they weren't describing harassment, they were talking about rape. Mm. So we were horrified, and, you know, then the murders happened, so the year later, there was a murder in Hawaii, Christine and Sandra Cass. When the murder happened, I said, I gotta make a film. Right. But the the way that the AA reacted to our letters, because we wrote these long letters, yeah. groups of us, that's when I said, I don't want to stay here, but I'm going to try to make it safer internally before I leave. Right, okay. And so yeah. it, was, it was the murder was the tipping point? It was, the murder was the tipping point, yeah. And how did you, how did you pull this here? Because you, you, you're effectively calling out the AA. Right. So, I mean, already everyone knows well, this is a big, I don't know if organisation is the right way to describe it. Right. So, I'm guessing what you're, you've got to think of is, okay, I'm going to make this film, definitely. Right. I want to make this film. But how do you get over the, step, the steps of, this is a big organisation, how is this going to, what's going to be the reaction, what have I got to prepare for? Was there, what kind of preparation did you have to do before you even started making it? I'm sort of thinking of the legalised sort of kind of it, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I, I wasn't a filmmaker, I, I was a, an actress, or I had studied acting for yeah. years and singing, but I had been around the film business and worked at 20th Century Fox, you know, and, but what I did is I took a class at UCLA for documentary filmmaking, mm -hmm. and in that you have to write a synopsis, and my teacher, who was, you know, older like me, and he was like, is this true? And I said, yeah. And he said, you're going to make a film, right? A full-length feature, if this is true. And I said, yeah. And he said, I said, yes. And I got a lot of support from people who were leaving that the film needed to be done because you could see as we tried, the pushback was so heavy that, and I was calling New York and talking to people, and I felt, oh my God, like, they're not going to do anything. Like, they literally voted to do nothing. And no, this is the tipping point. They created a subcommittee uh, in, within New York a, a, I, I, yeah. AA World Headquarters for sexual harassment and um, for to deal with this safety issue. And when I called one of the women, I said, oh my God, I just oh, found yeah. out that the courts are ordering sex offenders to AA meetings and there's teenagers there. And she said, oh, well, we're AA. We know we can get around that. Really? And I said, what did you just say Seriously? to me? Seriously? Yeah, I said, what did you just say to me? And she said, and I was like, Oh my God, this is what I'm up against. But I didn't see AA as huge as the institution mm. in the beginning. I don't think I, it would have been too daunting, but now I know how infested it is everywhere uh, in, in, with the pilots and the nurses and the doctors and lawyers, everybody who's a professional is getting, is getting forced to go to AA, even though their third tradition says, you know, you you have to you can you have to have the desire to come here. Nobody should be forced. That's AA's tradition. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. But that's not what's going on all over America. Like if you're a pilot and or a nurse, you're bored, and they do it in a way that is un, not as that even a criminal. So they're treated worse than a criminal who gets in front of a judge and he says, like in the movie, well either you go to one AA meeting a week or you're in prison. Of course he's going to pick the 1A meeting, mm, but if you're a pilot, that's not what happens to you. Right. You get extorted, you get made to go to a rehab that costs 30, 40, 50,000, you have to see a psychiatrist that you have to pay $2,500 a session, and, you, you're, and they treat sponsors like they're professionals, which they're not. 
And so it was like, I was like, what? Every time I would find out something, I was like, oh my God, this is bigger than I thought. So would, in your opinion, I'm choosing my words carefully here, is it, would you say, would you liken it to a corporate entity rather than a organizational entity? Is that the right way to describe it? Because, because I always thought it was like a, 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 a like, non-profit. Well, non-profit, and you, you know, surprising to hear that um, you are, not forced to attend, but I always imagined that you done it as a voluntary thing rather than right. but yeah. the way it's being described and obviously you touched on is it's almost like a machine that's run for a money making exercise. And I, that I hasten to, I should say allegedly, I mean, I'm being careful in the way I'm sort of describing it, but that's how it's coming across, you see. AA gets their money, half of it comes from the quarters and dollars that people put in the basket yeah. that gets distributed and people in groups all over the country mail a percentage back to New York. Right. But the other half at least comes from them selling literature, big books in 12 and 12, their literature to non-AA members. So they're selling it to Hazleton and Betty Ford and all the rehabs, yeah. Yeah. which they're a lot. And I mean, I thought it was a million dollar industry. It's a billion dollar industry. Sure. Yeah, it's a billion. The rehab industry. Yeah. And the thing where they want to say it's separate, it's not because most of the people who, what they call them, two hatters, so that you're an AA member and now you're going to work in the field. So the field of alcohol, you know, substance abuse and rehab. Yeah, so, and the thing, your question though, to answer it, it's a, it's a non-profit. But what's in, happened in our judicial system is that they've made it a dumping ground like for everybody. So 1.4 million, like when I was doing the research in 2010, 1.4 million people got a DUI. Everybody sent to AA. Even if the judge doesn't say it in the courtroom, when you go to the classes that they make you, so then you have to go to a class, and then you got to clean up the freeway, and then you got to work in a thrift yeah, store, yeah, yeah. whatever. Along with that, they, in California, it was the AB 541 that they passed this law, and in every state it's a little different. But when you go to those classes, they're there telling you you got to go to support groups. Which one? AA. And the, if you say, no, I don't, like, you can get serious resistance, you can get thrown out of that class or, or not. But there's a machine. Pro probation is all linked with abstinence and AA or NA. I had no idea. No, I, I, I mean, obviously, I, I really had no idea because the, 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 the way the American system works. It's, 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 hearing this is quite uh, shocking. Is probably the wrong word, but it's it's almost like um, well, you're forced, aren't you? Frankly, yeah. Oh, you're, and if I'm honest, you're forced. So the word being coercion. Coercion, yeah. But you know, a lawyer educated me, and when I told him what was going on with specifically the pilots, he said that's extortion. Like you can't say you have to go to AA or you can't fly, or you can't have your medical license. That's what they're doing. And you're, this, even this idea of being, you're actually being forced to join an organization. Mm. Yes. So imagine that, in America, you're being forced to join an organization, not just attend a few meetings for the professionals, all of them, nurses, when you're, a, when you're a nurse and you go seek help, not even getting into trouble. I'm talking about people that have contacted me that they didn't sell drugs illegally. No. They were just drinking too much. And, and they felt that, yeah. And they were yeah. like, let me, let me go and get some help. And then they go down this road and in the Board of Nursing, when you go before the board, you don't bring your employer, your husband. They want you to bring your AA sponsor. And I'm like, your AA sponsor could be some knitting lady, the PTA woman. That's really so they've made them like they're, they have this power. And I was outraged. I was really outraged. Oh, just, I'm shocked. Yeah, I was shocked. And, and, and mad, you know, for these guys, for these people. They're ruining their lives. Doctors have committed suicide. Pilots have committed suicide. Because the stress of it all, mm -hmm. the hell of it all. There are a couple of police officers that got sent, got DUIs, and, and you could read it in the news that they were sent, and they killed themselves. They don't want to go there. That's where they're sending all the criminals. Why, you know? And 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 the the program that they are made to go on, a typical program, right. is there like a time limit that it would be, I don't know, three months, it just doesn't work that way. The, the, the program then comes as and when someone from AA says, well, actually, that's the end of it. So does that mean you could be stuck? Stuck is the wrong one. Does that mean you could be enrolled into their program? It could be, you don't know how long it's going to last. Well, I wouldn't say enrolled. Like, there's no such thing as ever be, and, and, but what's interesting... You see what I mean? Though? Yeah. I, I do, though. So, a person who gets into trouble or who gets a DUI, the first time you're going to get sent for like six meetings, maybe. But mm. you get a second, they're going to tell you to go to 25. If it's a third, they're going to go to 52. 
But are you asking about the professionals? I'm really kind of trying to understand. Once you go on this program, yeah, where where you would have a you would know how long it would last. So you'd be sick uh, it's forever. Yeah, so that, it's that, kind that, of right. unlike smart, where it says you know just come until you feel stable, which maybe it might take somebody two years, a year, but it's up to the individual. Yeah. Where AA, they say you know there is no like because really what they tell you is like if you ever leave here like in the beginning it's like take what you like and leave the rest you know just do but if you go into a hardcore cultish type of meeting like the Atlantic group or the Pacific group and there are versions of that in London that you're gonna have people all over you telling you have to wear a suit and tie and the women have to wear dresses and you need a sponsor and you need to call three people a day and you need to go to so they're actually gonna on you and tell you exactly what to do and how to do it and become very controlling. Whereas you could go to a really laid back meeting and people would just shake your hand and you could kind of do whatever you want or not do whatever you want. You could come however long or leave whenever you want, but once you're there and going and people get to know you, then what's, what's yeah. repeated in the meeting is if you ever leave here, you're going to die, go insane, go to prison. Yeah. Like it's very much like a cult where somebody, and people say, is it a cult or not? Well, if somebody tells you, only we can help you, Steve, that is a marker for a cult. Yeah, then the, well, the alarm bells are going. Right. If, or if somebody says, you know, you're going to drink, you're going to die, you're going to go insane if you leave here. And the, yeah, so it's very like rogue. Is the right word? Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, I understand. There's like that's rogue meetings, and then there's these super controlling meetings where people tell people who to date. Who to date? Who to, who to date. The Midtown group that was exposed in Newsweek magazine in 2007. I couldn't get anybody to talk from that story. But that kind of leading me on to the question of how did you get the people to... Because that's going to be, I it's imagine, hard. quite difficult. Right. Be very difficult. That's right. So how, did you, how on earth did you manage to... Because it must have been... A hellish journey to get anyone to talk. It was. So in the beginning, the first one came from the Make A Safer workshop that I held in, mm. Co in Culver City. And we had people come from the whole area, and we had we spoke and had discussion, and they said there was a rapist in West Covina. And from that, people were on Facebook, and this one woman, which was the beginning of social media talking, mm. because everybody was always like, got to talk on a blog and be anonymous and everything. And she, oh, I overheard and someone said, oh my God, they were talking about the rape and this workshop. And then this woman chimed in and said, my son was murdered. And I was like, what? You know, and, and we cut in communication. And she was about a two hour drive. And I hired a young filmmaker who knew how to shoot, how to, you know, shoot a camera. Yes. And we, we drove out there and got the first interview. And then through the blogs, so blogging was very, very important yeah, at the yeah. beginning. The woman who ran the biggest blog, Stinkin' Thinking, knew of the board member that I interviewed. And she said, you need to call Jim. I called Jim and he agreed and I drove 800 miles to interview him. And those were the more rough interviews in the film, where he's the guy in the blue shirt. Mm. He, he was on the board of Alcoholics Anonymous when I my letter came. And he said when he watched that happen, he, he, he and this other guy left after that. Because they, what they did is... Anyway, I don't really want to get so into it. No, no, no. I, you know, I don't want to say anything that, that you don't want to talk about. But I, I was just interested in the generalization of... Um, how you managed to get these people on. Right, right. it so must it, have been it, so it, tough. So that is how it happened. So because of uh, the blogs, when people, and I have a blog, so I have a Stop 13 Step in AA blog where people would land and they would tell these stories. And some of them would just like leave their name, which usually you're not supposed to, you're supposed to make up a, a fake handle, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, I would. But when I would read the horror stories, I could see who, and I would send them an email right away, and then in 24 hours we're on the phone talking. And that was the woman in Ohio called me, and um, and they would tell me, I would call the police sometimes for them. They would call me and tell me what's happening, and I'd say, what, well, haven't you called the police? All right, well, I'll call the police. And the police were like, why don't these people go outside and beat them up and throw them out? And I'm like, yeah, I know. You know, well, this is what's going on in AA. They're covering up for a guy who stands up and says, I raped a 12-year-old. And I'm outraged across the country. So the blogging through people like that, and then I had a radio show. I have a, a blog talk radio show. That's really how people came to me.
all through that. And as it grew, people were willing to, some of them were right away, like the girl in Kentucky, she was furious. Like she went into that clubhouse and she just like let him have it and they were like screaming at her and yelling at her and she fled and then she met an old timer, somebody with like 30 years who said, I know about this woman, you know, Monica Richardson, she's making it, she goes, I want to talk, I want to talk. Were you ever, I mean look, <clears throat> this is a compliment, you've got a, a good strong personality, yeah. which are, you would need, I guess. Like, yeah, I guess so. But even so, when you're fighting a battle like yeah, this. Yeah, well, and, and even so, when you're listening to these stories thinking, I've, I've got to make a film, but was there a point where you thought, this is going to be trouble? Uh, I mean, you, you know, in terms of what kind of reaction are you going to get? Um, did you ever reach a point where you thought, this, could be, this is so tough, I'm not sure I can actually... Well, you just because you're driven. Yeah. But every human yeah. has, has a point where they you think, oh God, I don't know if I can yes. do much more of this. Right. So there were, I had two health issues. I had a brain tumor in the beginning. Right. Of that surgery. Right. That's when I met Carla Brada's parents right after that surgery. That didn't stop me. But then I had breast cancer last year. For eight months, I had to stop. Right. But sometimes I would, especially when I met some of the professionals, started to contact me, and I started to see how really deep it was in the judicial system and. <coughs> in Hollywood. And entrenched. Yeah. Entrenched, yeah, yeah. That I would go, I, I'd say to my husband, like, maybe this is too big, mm. you know. And there was only a short time that I got discouraged and I thought, I don't know if I can, uh, I don't know, not finish it, but it's too big. Like, I'm taking on a Goliath. Yeah, yeah. And you know, Jim said to me, it was these people that, other people who were ex-AA members, who said, you're taking on Goliath. You just need to know well, that you're yeah. David and there's Goliath and you're taking on one of the worst states in the United States, which is California, is the most infested in government with AA. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, really. And I didn't really care because, you know, I was an AA member for so long and I gave a lot of my, I, I was of service very much for the first 10 years of my life. And what they're doing is really wrong and they're really organized and they could make changes really fast. And I'm like, nope. No, you. I'm going to force you yeah, to change. Gonna, yeah. And so it was just brief to answer, answer the question. There was a brief doubt, and I had a couple, you know, ones. A couple of wobbles. Yeah. Wobbles where I was like, ah. and then I just. But then CBS 48 Hours did a piece. That was the thing that really helped me. So when the murder trial finally started with Eric Allen Earl and, and Carla Broadus murder trial, CBS 48 Hours came through Gabriel Glaser, and they interviewed me. And we didn't put it in the movie, but. They, I was walking around with a CBS reporter that took me serious and the head of this particular unit. So I felt really validated by that. Mm -hmm. And we took them to meetings and we, I took them to, we would try to get, you know, more su subjects to talk. It was really hard for that. Nobody would be like me and say, yeah. I this happened, yeah. After that was over, there were women now that would come forward and men. But at, even when we were doing the 48 hours piece, The Sober Truth, uh, it was very hard to find someone else to say this out loud and be lit. And what kind of... You've had reaction from AI. From AI. I, I, what, what's, what's, is really. it possible to put into a nutshell the kind of reaction you've had from you? Or is it just too... Long, you know, not long. Is it, is it, is it still ongoing? What, what have you had from them? No, so they haven't done anything. Like once I went in there, seriously. No, in fact, that's, they, that's, that's no, unbelievable. Nothing, nothing. They did contact another woman who wrote a piece. Yeah. Uh, Tracy Chabala, and they actually wrote her a letter to ask her to stop talking the way she was about AA, and she wasn't even bashing AA the way I do. Now, you, are you surprised? Because I'm very surprised you've had no reaction. No, I'm not surprised. Because I think they're bullies. I think AA is filled with bullies. They're fi they have some really nice people, and really great people, but there is a component personality that when they get a lot of time and they're sober a long time, either they're really great people or they're bullies. And a bully is a coward, really deep down. And Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole at the top is making a lot of money. It's like 12 million a year. Yeah. Half of it's not coming from the members. They're making three, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year. The head, the, the head person does. And uh, I'm ready to contact them again though when I get back home. So we sent a petition uh, to New York about a month ago. That's very has very detailed comments. It's not just signatures. You yeah, know? yeah, it's yeah. like really. This so, happened then. Yeah. yeah right. Please make it because. Please make it because. 
and uh, I'm going to start making phone calls as an activist to to try to get them to change, to try to get them out of the courts. I'm a both ends. But I'm amazed that they haven't even tried defending. After. But, but I feel like they've done it in in sort of a roundabout way in that very hard to get certain people to tell the story in the news mm. like they're kind of everywhere they've become journalists they've become filmmakers and writers and producers so I'm really up against a big they're kind of like everywhere like it's worse than Scientology for sure they're much bigger that's, every time you're talking the way that's kind of what I'm thinking actually the sign because that was the 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 way that I perceive Scientology, yeah. um, the way you're describing AA and this kind of entity mm -hmm. with tendrils all over the country is kind of how I'd imagine, no we're going on peace here, but that's the vibe that I'm feeling from the way you're describing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's but I, I'm still amazed that you've had nothing because that's that was going to be the first question god you must have had so much grief from them about it but no and i was afraid uh from my safety in the beginning right but once i was on katie couric once i was on cbs 48 hours once gabrielle glaser the journalist who wrote the piece on the atlantic and propublica i it's not just me talking yeah because suddenly it's out there and it's so much bigger isn't it so right it'd be very oh i get it so it'd be much more difficult for them to intimidate because you like you say you've had validation now right right had you been alone. on your own yeah, yeah you weren't alone yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but I, I know what kind of people are in there and in meetings and you have hitmen and killers and people who've either been reformed i guess you would call the old school word is reforming a reformed alcoholic or someone but you know there's like i said like every kind of person in there so you're going to have a really great teacher and then you're going to have a guy who's killed people and you're going to have a pedophile who's and you're going to have a rapist and then you're going to have a wonderful lawyer and a wonderful pilot and pilot and a wonderful mom and so but a lot of what we didn't know and even me with 30 something years the reason I did it for the murder was when we did the trail and, and I contacted the news and 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 the and the, um, the newspapers in Honolulu that in the first story it doesn't mention AA but the second one they went back and they were like red flags missed is what it said in the headlines and then they interviewed people and that he had been sent to Alcoholics Anonymous by a judge and a healthcare professional and he stalked her. I mean, I literally found her best friend and talked to her on the phone. And she was not his girlfriend, even. And, you know, it just was like, how is this happening? That was the first, like, oh, how sinister. is this happening? That's, it feels sinister. Do the judges not know what AA is? So maybe they, maybe they. some of them don't. Maybe they don't. Some of them do, and some of them don't really know. That's outrageous, though, that our courts would send something to an unprofessional setting and send a pilot and a nurse and a, and a doctor. And see if she wants me to come in. I mean, it's not medicine. No. And even the, even the story about, like, disease, you know, it's like, well, it's a disease or not? Like, so if it was a disease, and you all have a brain disease, well, why aren't you going to your GP, you know, your general practitioner, or a, um, a neuro, whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. a neuro doctor? Uh, why are you going to a church basement talking with lay people, reading a book from the 30s? Yeah, yeah. So what is it then? You know? Yeah. So it, it it's a really weird. It's a big beast. Monica, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so wonderful. Much. And like I always say to every filmmaker, you. typically you've all got fantastic stories to tell. I mean that. Thank you. Thanks so the best of luck with us. Thank you. Thank I really you. appreciate it.